Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. After understanding the sequence centric proteogenomics, we will now listen Dr. Kelly Regal's talk about variant analysis and its effect on other biomolecules leading to various clinical conditions. She will also talk about how to read dot VCF file and also about informatic tools for creating the customized databases. She will discuss about how one could create variant peptide manually by using integrative genomics viewer or IGV to understand the basics. However, once they have understood the basic mechanism, one can use different softwares to develop variant peptides. Let us now welcome Dr. Kelly Regis again to tell us more in depth about creating and analyzing variant peptides. I'm going to walk you through doing this by hand even though we now have tools to do this but I think it's good to do these things by hand sometimes. So what you have is your, your um, reference genome so this would be HG38 or HG19 um, and you have the sequence you add your variants in to the sequence within these exon boundaries you do an in silico translation and you throw these into your database and then you can actually search against your database to find them in your mass spec data. So um, these are examples that um, David actually just showed but you know we might as well just look at them again with the now understanding a little more about it. So here you can see there is a SNP that's occurring um, at, at, at this location in, um, in this protein. Um, so it goes from a, a valine to an isoleucine and then you can identify this within your data or in some cases you can have um, a stop code on introduction. So instead of, of the, being a full protein sequence, you'll actually have part of it. As David mentioned, this is a lot harder to validate, right, because we don't always have coverage in proteomics. So are we not seeing it because it's not there or are we not seeing it because we're just not able to measure it? Um, or in some cases it can go from having a stop code on to having um, an amino acid. So here it would just continue on and you would get a novel protein um, that would continue translation after the original stop code on. So there are a couple of different tools for this. Um, I mentioned two because these are the two that were created by two people who are in this room. He, uh, his group was responsible for custom ProDB and then David and I worked on um, quilts. And so you can use both of these. I've linked to them. Um, so you're able to put in um, uh, uh, either VCF files and or bed files and get back a database that has all of your information in it. Um, so it sort of sits here. So after you do your next generation sequencing data, you get this, the splice junction bed files and your variant, your VCF files. And then Quilts and Custom Pro DB can then create databases for you that you can then use to do your um, peptide identification. And here's Quilts if you want to go. Um, it's just a, 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 this is the web page. So you're able to just upload your data here and then you can get, um, uh, you can get your databases out of it from there. This one, um, right now, it's, um, you can just do human on the website. But if you're interested in other, we can, we can chat. Okay, so this is where I wanted to talk about um, uh, kind of walk through what we're going to do on the hands-on before we actually do the hands-on. We'll see if that helps um, with the actual hands-on. So, so um, you're welcome to try and follow along, but um, you know, I, let's wait for questions until the actual hands-on. Um, so I just kind of want to show you what we're going to be doing, and we're going to use a different example for the hands-on itself. So if you haven't downloaded IGV, please do so. So we're going to do create a variant peptide by hand. So um, once you have IGV open, you can, oh, you can, create, you, you can zo uh, zoom in and out on different genes pretty easily. Um, and so if you go to the search field and type in, I just picked a gene so that you could just get sort of zoomed in. So I picked ERBB2 in the search field. 
um, and then you're able to sort of zoom in on one gene and then you can change these coordinates either by picking a gene or just typing in different coordinates and it will move you along um, the, the um, genome. And so the reason I wanted uh, to show you this is because there is this, this line, this, you can drag up and down once you've zoomed in enough and we'll, we, if you, you don't have to do this right now, we're going we're gonna to do it during the hands-on, but if you drag it down, you actually get the sequence information of the genome and that's going to be something that's going to be really useful for actually doing the hands-on itself. So you'll end up getting something that looks like this. And this is the, so what's up here is the genome sequence and then this is the um, three, the, the three frame translation. So this is amino acids and we'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see. So it actually does the translation for you. Um, so you can zoom in and you see this is the genome sequence and then here you can, you can see that there's the um, amino acid translations from the genome sequence and then it has the annotation for the actual ERBB2 exons here as well. And then you can flip on this arrow to get if you're looking at a negative strand versus a positive strand. So this is really important here and you can flip back and forth and it will flip the translation, um, the, three, the three frame translation for you. Um, okay, so when we're creating this variant peptide by hand, this is the first entry from the VCF file. For the hands-on, we're gonna do the second entry. Um, but you can upload files into, in your own files into, into this and then actually visualize them. So here you would upload your, the SNP VCF file, so it's the sequence pg-snp.vcf. So you would go to IGV, there's a file, and then you load the file, and then you'll see if you go to this position, chromosome 3, in the position within this VCF, that VCF file, you actually are able to see that it, it labels your variant. So you have the variant labeled here. Um, so then you can zoom in by entering into the search field exactly where the position is and you see the variant location of this gene here. And then what we'll do is we'll just do the translation, the in silico translation, um, using the information that's provided here for the sequence so that we can actually sequence a peptide um, that ha would have this variant within it and then change that amino acid to the correct amino acid based on the, the, the SNP that's, that's there. So, so here we would start here. So the variant again is here. So it's a G to C, so this is a G. So everything before the variant is the same, right? So we don't have to do anything. We can just kind of copy exactly what, what's there in the, in the reference. So it's L, T, H, G, D, S, V, and then we get to the variant, right? And we gotta figure out what it is. So now we know that it was a G, A, C, and now it's a C, A, C, and then you ha can go up to your handy um, codon, translations and figure out that it was a D and now it's an H. So now you can add that in and then now you can have your in silico translation of um, your SNP at the protein level. Um, and then so the output for, um, for quilts and custom pro DB will look something like this where you'll have a FASTA file which has a header that sort of has information about, about the SNP that was incorporated into the sequence and then it will have um, I've bolded here the full triptych peptide that would include that SNP. The blue is what I just showed in the demo. I didn't inc include the whole peptide. You could go through though and scroll in and, and look at it. And then the H is what the, where the actual SNP is. So, um, so we're going to do a similar example in demo, a different SNP um, and actually going in the negative direction. Any questions on this that are not needed for, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's a couple of different tools. I like this one the best. That's why I use it. Um, but there are, I mean, UCSC also, you can use that. There's a, there's a couple of different genome browsers. So like you can use, use your favorite. Um, this is just the one that I decided was the most user friendly. So I use it. Yeah. Say that again. The variant file information, which the variant. Uh, like yeah. Information only you can give you in VC file format or any other file format you also like in the various tools. So, 
Uh, so you're saying, can you use a different imp import input format? Yeah. You may be able to use math files, but I haven't tried. Um, what kind of file format were you thinking? Like a file in which uh, the, the header file, like it's in pasta format, and the header contains the, all the variation information. Like at what point? Yeah, it, you'd have to kind of parse it out and make it into a VCF file, is what I would recommend doing. Um, it's definitely particular about its file inputs. Yeah, I think all of them are though, so. Other questions? Okay. So um, we can also look at novel expression uh, identification, meaning um, novel alternative splicing or um, fusion genes. So here are a couple of examples. So for example, we, if we have two known exons, but let's say that they're combined in a way that is not annotated, so it's a new alternative splicing event that doesn't have novel expression in terms of new exons, but it's just a new way of connecting exons, so that's one example. You could have an example where one exon's connected to the middle of another exon, so it chops off the beginning of it, or maybe it's um, one exon's connected to an intr it, intronic region, so it's actually adding on some um, sequence before the, the annotated exon. Or maybe it's in an, an intergenic region, so it's a whole, it's past where we think the gene ends um, can occur. Or maybe it's just completely novel. Maybe it's, it, there's no boundaries, exon boundaries that exist that are annotated. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that this can, these things can be combined. Um, if you're doing genome annotation, you'll have, have a similar, this will be the same kind of problem that you'll face. So this can go for either, either of those questions. And also fusion genes. We talked yesterday about fusion genes, right? If you have gene X, one of the exons of gene X is connected to another exon in gene Y, you're going to have a totally new um, uh, gene or sequence that you'd have to also add into your database in order to find it. So we can take our RNA-seq data and the information we get from that, including the junctions and the fusion genes, throw those into our database, and then we're able to find these um, tumor-specific uh, proteins as well. So, yeah, this is kind of the same. So you could either have different new alternative splicing or even just completely novel expression. Okay, so the, this really uh, requires a bed file. I also included an example bed file in your zip folder. It has a very specific format where you have the chromosome, your genes start and end. In this case, it would be a junction start and end, but you, you can kind of treat it the same way. A name, a score, some information on strand, and just display info. You'll notice if you open the bed file, I changed some of the colors specifically so that during the demo, we can point things out. So you can see there's, um, there's RGB numbers in there that have been altered for that reason. Um, the number of exons or blocks, the, num the size of these exons and the start of these exons. And I showed this yesterday, I'm just going to show it one more time because we're going to be thinking about this a lot. So in our bed file, we have the start of the gene, right? And then we have the, the first block start will be zero, it will start where the gene starts. And then it will be, the exon is 126 uh, nucleotides long, so it will make 126. And then we'll continue doing this. So you always take the start, and then you add the block start to get the start of the exon, and then you add the block size to get the end of the exon. And you continue doing this for each of the different exons. Um, so that's how you sort of parse out the bed file to get the actual genome annotation from it. And the junction files, so if you run RNA-seq on the sample, the junction files will just indicate where the um, the boundaries between the exons that are spliced together are. So if block one and block, if exon one and two are spliced together, you'll have a junction um, read here. If um, block two and three are spliced together, you'll have a junction read here. If block exon one and three are spliced together, so, so on and so forth. So you'll, you'll see how these um, junctions are, you'll, are visualized in, in the IGV and hopefully it will be clear. So what we do to create this splice junction databases is we take this junction bed file, 
we compare it to the known annotation, so we just take everything out that's known because we don't, it's not that we don't care, but that we, that's already included in our reference. So we want to take those out and just get things that are new. And then, so we take the, the new um, file, bed file with the new gene mapping, and then we figure out what kind of mapping it is. So is it just an unannotated alternative splicing? So we already know the exons, but it's spliced in a new way. Is it, what, does it map to one end of an exon, but not the other end is mapped to something new, or is it just completely new? And the way that we deal with this is um, changes based on how, what kind of novel splicing it is. So here would be an example of um, a alternative splicing with two exons that are known, right? So um, you can see here, and this is the peptide data, um, and this is the exon structure, you can see that there's actually evidence for this in, at the peptide level where you're connecting this exon and, um, with, a new ex, with another exon that's known but did not have um, annotation already in the database for that connection. Or a connection between an exon and some um, intergenic region. So here's an example where we have an exon that's annotated connected to the, this um, intronic region here. And there's evidence at the peptide level for this connection because we added this um, into the database. Or also you can have, as I mentioned, these completely novel peptides where it's just either in intronic or intergenic regions. Um, and you can sort of see in this case it was in the middle of an exon and then in the middle of, at the end of an exon. So there's, these, are, these are less likely, especially in a really well annotated database, but you do find them. Okay, so again, you can, you can put your bed file into these tools and just create your database using them, but um, we're going to do one by hand. So you upload your bed file the same way you would upload your, um, your VCF file. So you load here, and I made you a very small bed file, but if you have the full bed file, you'll have things that look like this. You'll have like every single junction that connects all sorts of different exons. Um, so what I did give you will look, should look like this. So you'll upload it and it will look like this. There's six different junctions that are included. Um, the purple ones are ones that are annotated and the red ones are novel. Um, full disclosure, disclosure, I made up the novel junctions just for this purpose. So. <laughs> um, I mean, they may occur in, in reality, but I just made them for the demo. Um, so when we open this up, and we'll open it up, and you can open it now, but we'll open it up in the demo, um, you'll, you should see this. Um, and what we'll do right now is just walk through how to by hand create this novel splice junction peptide. So what you can see here is these connect, so the purple connects annotated exons, so this would be um, this exon connects to this one, this exon connects to this one, and then there's this red junction that connects this exon to something in the middle of an intron. So there's novel expression here. So what we're going to do is figure out how to make the peptide that bridges the, not, the known exon with the novel expression. So if we zoom into this exon here, the known exon, which I've included the boundaries for here, You'll see that there is, again, this is the genome sequence, and this is the three-frame translation. And then right here is the actual annotated gene. So since this novel junction is actually downstream of a known exon, we can just keep this sequence as is, right? Because it's not changing frame, and we know that this exon is still being um, uh, transcribed in the same way. So now we have, or translated, sorry, in the same way. So now we can just take this chunk of sequence and just sort of have it. Um, and then we're going to add to the end of this the novel sequence. But what we have to pay attention to here, right, is that we have this sequence that ends, but there, this G that's here is actually not, it's assuming that the next thing that comes up is, um, is annotated, but it's actually just two Gs that are hanging after the annotated D. 
and we're going to add something new to the end. So we have to, to keep that in mind, right? So we have these two guanosines that are left hanging and they're going to attach to this new boundary. So, so we keep the, the, the amino acid sequences, uh, the peptide sequence from before this and we remember that the two Gs are here. And then we look at the other side of the junction and we can see at the other side of the junction, we take the two Gs and then we add on the actual genome sequence from the other side of the junction here from the novel expression. And then we are able to use this information, right, to actually encode what, what this new novel expression would look like. So we can um, get our new amino acids and add those in. And you can then take these, so this G would be the, the barrier between the known and the unknown, and throw these into our, um, our database as well so that we are able to find, hypothetically, this new boundary in our data. So these are really hard to find, right? Because to prove that this is happening, you really need to be able to identify this, this boundary between the known exon and the new exon. Um, and so it, you have to be able to find that one peptide that proves that that's actually occurring, which is very, it's, it's not so likely. So if you don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not happening. It just, if you do find it, it's, it's exciting. Um, and we'll talk about, um, the likelihood of finding these kinds of things in real data. So in addition to this, as I mentioned, you can also include these fusion genes in, in your data. So this is an example of what um, different outputs for fusion genes look like. Um, I like this because I think it looks, I don't know, kind of like art. Um, so if you zoom in on here, these are actually sequences. So everything up to this point is reads from RNA-seq for one gene and then reads from RNA-seq from another gene and it's just showing how the two are fused together in this, this, um, this cancer data set. So you, you would really want to take this boundary and add this into your database. So you would take the boundary here, find the consensus sequence of this boundary, and then you do a six frame translation and add that into your database as well. Again, very hard to identify this in real data, but worth trying if you have, if you have it. Okay, so this is really specifically important in cancer because as you've heard many times, there's a lot of altered expression, um, either SNPs, right, mutations causing changes in protein expression. Um, and we really wanna understand if they're, these are found at the protein level and if they are, what their effect is on the protein function. Just showing that there's a lot of variability in how much variation occurs in different tumors, even if they're in the same, the same type of tumor. So, Here's human breast tumors and you, these, the circles plots just showing the rearrangement within each of the tumors. And you can see that they're really different and highly variable. So some of them don't have a lot and some of them do. So there's two studies that I wanted to talk about. Um, one of them is a study you've already heard a lot about. It's the CPTAC uh, retrospective um, breast study where we looked at these 77 tumors um, to we looked at a lot of different things within these tumors. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we looked at the um, effects of somatic mutations and also within the proteomics data, if we were able, what, what we were able to find in terms of um, mutations uh, at the protein level. And then also these patient-derived xenograft tumors. So these are tumors that are injected into immunodeficient mice and they're able to grow on these mice. Um, this is a very cool system because you can have many, many mice that have the same tumor and you can treat them with different things or you can, you can just grow lots and lots of the same tumor for all sorts of different um, QC experiments or just to better understand that tumor. Um, so this was two different tumors that were really used as quality control within experiments. They're still being used actually. Um, for, for the studies that are ongoing. And what's cool about these is that they were measured over and over and over again. Um, so we use the fact that they were measured over and over and over again to really understand where we're at in terms of our depth of discovery of these protein variants. So we'll talk about that one first. So we had these two tumors. They were basal and luminal tumors. Um, there was, uh, proteomics was completed as we've discussed with ITRAC. And then there was genome and transcriptome sequencing that was done. And these were um, incorporated into this protein database using quilts. Um, 
And then we did novel peptide identification, filtered out the mouse proteins and just the normal proteins we expect to see based on a reference database, and then looked at things that were um, novel, based, so either novel junctions or, or, somat or SNPs. So what we found um, was that, so if you look, these are the two different tumors. So this is the, um, the blue is all of the DNA variants um, that we identified, so in the, in the genomics data. Then at the RNA level, it's the purple. And then at the protein level, it's the orange. Um, and this is for the basal tumor and the luminal tumor. So what you can see from this is that um, we were only able to find, so about 3% of the predictive genomic SNPs were actually found at the protein level. And about 10% of those at the RNA level were found at the protein level. So there's, there's a lot of reasons that this could happen, right? So maybe a SNP causes the protein to be degraded, so we're not going to find it. Or maybe a SNP causes the protein, the peptide to be homologous to another, another part of the proteome. So we're going to assume that it's normal even if it's not. Um, maybe we just don't have the coverage to find these. So there's a lot of, just because we only find 3% doesn't mean that those are the only 3% that make it to the protein level. Um, so it, this was just kind of a way of, of assessing where we're at in terms of our ability to discover these. Um, and this is just some examples of somatic SNPs that were identified that are, are cancer related. Uh, we also looked at the novel, these novel junctions, if we're able to identify novel junctions in our data. Um, again, the two different tumors. So the purple is um, all of the no novel junctions that were identified by RNA-seq. Um, the blue is ones that had at least five reads. So some of them, you know, they're just like one read and probably just kind of garbage. Um, so we wanted to make that clear as well. But it, you can see these tiny little dots here um, are the number of novel junctions that we were able to identify at the peptide level. So very, very few. Um, again, this may not be because they don't exist, right? Because in order to find, to prove that these novel uh, um, splice, splicing um, events are occurring, you have to find that peptide that exists right at that junction. And maybe the peptide at that junction is too big or too small or homologous to something else or, you know, so, so it's, it, it's not that these are the only ones that exist, it's just that they're the only ones we were able to find using this method. I think this is also very, um, shows how well the human genome is annotated. I think that's a, you know, if this was a less annotated, um, species, we find a whole lot more um, new, new, new splice sites. Um, and then the last thing I will discuss is this, uh, just quickly, is the, um, the CPTAC data. So the, again, the 77 breast tumors. And so here is actually um, a analysis where we combined all 77 and looked at them together. But it's a similar kind of Venn diagram where we have uh, all of our DNA variants we have our RNA variants, and then we have um, only 4% of them were found at the protein level. So similar, similar to what we, we showed in the last data set. Um, and the red is just our somatic variants. And most of these were, had been identified previously by, by just as existing. The, the, so they either were in the dbSNP database, the COSMIC database, and only a small percentage of them were completely novel. And then there are just a couple of examples here of, of um, SNPs that were identified within this data. Okay, so um, the last thing I just wanted to quickly talk about was map, proteogenomic mapping. So this is mapping, so let's say you find new cool peptides, but you want to map them back onto the genome. Um, so this if you have a lot of them, really requires automation. So um, we have come up, so this would be, a, the reason you would do this would be to try and visualize it alongside your genomics data. So let's say you want to put it up in IGV and just see, like, with, alongside your junctions, make sure that it makes sense that you're, that's actually proving that your junction exists. And just kind of having it all in one, in one, vis, in, in one, um, one browser. 
So um, this tool PGX, where you can put your peptides and your sample specific uh, database in, and it will map onto genomic coordinates. So here is just showing a schematic of where you could have all your copy number, your methylation data, your um, RNA-seq data, your, and your peptides all mapped to a chromosomal location. And then you can look and see how things are quantitatively changing. Um, and so it, what happens is you can use all of this data um, to create bed files. And the bed files, again, are what you, you then use and input into the IGV as um, we did with the junction data. Um, so this is just an example. So this is a spectra from this um, variant um, that was identified in a tumor. I think this is probably from the CompRef data. So we have this, um, I can't actually read what that is, a T to A here. Um, and you can put, it, uh, this is a track showing where the variants are. And then you can actually just uh, map your tumor peptide and just make sure it maps to the same place. And then you can have your novel peptide data where you have your junction. So this is the RNA-seq data. And then you see in green, this is a peptide that spans the exact same novel junction that we found at the RNA level. And so you can actually visualize them together just to see that you're actually um, seeing the same um, boundary that was predicted by your RNA-seq. And then you can throw everything up there and look at it all at once. So this is, includes the reads from RNA-seq data. Um, this is the annotation. This is pro, the prote proteomic mapping, uh, all of your variants. So if you want to throw everything up there and look at it at once, you can too. So I wanted to just thank everyone in my lab, um, the FENU lab, and of course, uh, CPTAC, where um, most of this work has been done. I hope today you have learned why is it important to know and understand the variant peptides. You also seen how integrative genomics viewer IGV can be operated and accessed to understand your data. You also heard about IGV helps us in finding what kind of mutations are present in a given gene by using VCF file containing details of all the SNPs in the data. Using the detail of mutated genes and type of mutation, one could create variant peptides as Dr. Kelly had just mentioned. IGV could also be used to visualize the novel expression due to the splicing. You also learnt about bed and bed junction files which contain the information about various possible splicing involved in a particular protein expression. The next lecture will be by a mass spectrometry scientist Dr. Suman Thakur who will talk about proteomics in clinical studies. Thank you.